gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mouthpiece. I am your host, Brady Matthews. Wowzers, we have a loaded show for you guys. Lots and lots to talk about. I'm super excited. It feels like Christmas in March. It really does because the NCAA tournament is underway. And uh, who doesn't love the first round of the games? Because that's all you bet on and you pretty much lose all your money. And then you go home and you cry to your wife, which is fine. That's okay. Uh, but we're going to talk about the uh, first round of the final four. I'm going to give you my final four picks. Some sleeper picks as well. Um, also, the NBA's young guns are shining through at the right time. Also, too, uh, we have a very special guest, an actual an expert, who will be breaking down all things sports stats and more, helping us all make sense of it all. Uh, with that said, though, let me introduce my all-star panel, my home team, if you will. Uh, next to me, he is the MVP of uh, the Malpies here, the one and the only, Chris Mano. Excited to be here Chris? today. I can't tell you how jacked up I am today. This is going to be a fun one, man. Lots Everything going stuff. on, and we got royalty in the house. For sure. You Valuetainment bet, Valuetainment royalty in the house. <laughs> you bet. It's going to be great. Next to him, uh, he is everything Mr. UFC. He is also stunt doubling as a uh, salsa dancer today. <laughs> He's auditioning for the George Lopez show. You're going to say Scarface, an extra Scarface. <laughs> He's got the best chest hair this side of the 95. Guys, going to go for Ray Sherwood. <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. There you go. Perfect. You sound it's going to be a like great him. show today. Yeah, so. I'm pumped. Right? You feeling good? I'm feeling it. I'm you have feeling a big today. party you have to go to tonight, yeah, right? Yeah, a penthouse party in Miami. That's why I'm dressed like wow. uh, I should be in Scarface. Wow. So. Give the girls a little taste yeah. of what you do with the teeth. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> Tom's like, uh, like uh, hey, scared. City, uh, city <laughs> he's scared. Uh, city next to Ray. He's the one that keeps the show on the tracks. Uh, he's uh, Cleveland's very own. He's our uh, he's our value team at Superstar. Guys, give it up for the one and the only Malik Hudson. Shout Malik. Shout Malik. There he is. He had a good bracket. With all that said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, like uh, Chris said, we do have a royalty in the house. You might have seen him on the PBD podcast. Uh, he's also a Pepperdine alum, right? Uh, he's also a star of his own show right here at Valuetainment called The Biz Doc. Guys, please make a warm welcome for the one, the only, Tom Ellsworth, everyone. How are you, Tom? Doing well. Thank you. You look fantastic. No jacket today. You look loose. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Comfortable. Yep. Uh, yeah, are you excited for the tournament? Are you pumped or what? Adam, you're wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. We had the um, home team today. It's just a reflex. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. the, um, I heard there were some fireworks. I heard that. That's okay. When aren't there? There are always fireworks. Yeah, you but know? see, Vinny and Sauce aren't here. Actually, Sauce is right over here. There he is. Yep. He just had Dave Rubin on his show. Fantastic show earlier is today. Is the Saucecast here? Yeah, he's yeah. right over there. Uh, but with that said, um, Tom... How's your bracket looking? Where are you at with the NCAA tournament? Are you, are you as excited as I am for uh, the NCAA tournament? I think it's almost as fun as the Super Bowl. What do you think? I, I get excited for the tournament. Um, I really don't tune into college basketball that much. Ever. But when I tune in, it's usually when it matters. So I like watching the conference tournaments. Sure. I, I lose, usually tune in when the conference tournaments are happening because <clears> – <throat> All the preseason stuff is junk. There's more development of the athlete and the team in a collegiate season than any other sport. Sure. You know, whether it's uh, college football or it's, you know, you watch. If somebody looks good competing for the Heisman the first two games and they just keep getting better, you really compare the first two games, the last two games, and, you, and, you're, and you, the development you'll see of a kid, especially sophomores, <clears throat> is just amazing. And it's the same thing for um, – the NCAA tournament. Yeah. So I've never been a Duke fan, but I've always loved the Duke North Carolina rivalry. So I was actually kind of bummed out that they're they had a star point guard yep. freshman, but he went out. He's I know. been out for five games for the tournament. Now yeah. he now he won't play in in the NCAA. And I think that's a bummer for Duke. It's a bummer for college basketball. But that's all part of it. Of course. And that's what makes the tournament so hard to pick, so exciting. Yeah. You know? well, I did case studies this week on NCAA tournament. And guess what? We're gonna broke get... down a bunch of stats. I didn't get into pick your bracket or who's gonna win. Right. I just kind of broke down history and stacks. It's it's so interesting. Yeah, but we're gonna do that here. I want to get to that in just a little bit. But actually, I, how I want to. Uh, start is I wanted to ask you about, because we were curious, you're a Formula One guy. You're a Formula One guy through and through. PBD's daughter is named uh, Senna. Uh, what got you into Formula One? Just to give people a little context of how you got into Formula One, your little bit of your background, just so people at home can get, you know, get to know Tom Ellsworth. Wow, so um, I guess it starts way back, like um, I, was, <clears throat> I was 16. Right. 
And my dad's friend from work had two sons that were working in motorsports. Right. And they were making safety equipment. <clears throat> Matter of fact, one guy pioneered uh, the seat that started saving lives uh, because he noticed the uh, compression on motorsports helmets. What most people don't know is starting in about 1978, you know, smart drivers, you had multiple helmets, and it wasn't for sponsors or colors. If you ever had an accident and it had measurable uh, compression, they would throw away the helmet or they would you know, sell it to charity or give it to somebody because the foam that was inside used to compress. And he said, why don't we make seats like this? Right. So he designed seats that were made out of the same oh, foam yeah. okay. that's inside the helmet, shaved them to the actual shape of the driver, actually took these beads with the special epoxy, would form it to the driver's back, shaved the back of it, fit it to the car. So he was now sitting basically in a helmet, if you want to think of it that way. Right, sure. So my dad's friend is doing that, and his friends work for teams at Indianapolis, including a guy named Dan Gurney. Yeah. And you heard of Dan Gurney? The good old Dan. Get legend, All-American Racers. And so Dan Gurney was there, and one of the sons was working for his team that year on a, for a guy named Mike Mosley. So I got involved when we go to Indy, right. meet Dan Gurney, see what these two guys were doing, my brother becomes friends with one of the brothers because they turned out living near us in Florida. And that started my real interest because I saw the sport like from the inside. Right. And you saw and all I'm the like, inner workings. And have you ever have you ever have you have you ever gotten into the sport itself? Did you ever want to get into the sport itself as you were growing no, up? No, no, no. I've been to you know, I'm in a motorsports school. Yeah. Uh, but I did that for driving, defensive driving, car control and stuff like that. But you know, you should not be uh, I'm a car enthusiast and I've owned some exotic vehicles. But you know, the highway is, you drive them and you appreciate them. You don't go out there driving to be an idiot because you can get more trouble faster. But I went to motorsports school to learn car control, learn safe driving, and yeah, to have fun. Yeah. And so I've seen it from that way. I've seen enough to know that you just don't appreciate the skill of the driver. So that, that little trip there, Gurney, All American Racing, led to a love of the sport. And the first driver that I really, really was keyed in on was a Canadian named uh, uh, Gilles Villeneuve. Mm -hmm. And he was driving for Ferrari. And he died. <clears throat> a terrible, terrible accident at Zandvoort and um, lost his life. Uh, and then his teammate, Didier Peroni, would have, suffer a horribly cataclysmic accident in the same kind of car, same Ferrari that year. And that kind of tuned me into the dangers. But it was from that era. And is it, this isn't from, because uh, it isn't from Ford versus Ferrari, because I know the gentleman that drove uh, was a Ferrari, because I know at the end of the movie, you know, he's driving. Oh, Nicky Lauda. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he died. I, boys, have you seen, you've seen Ford versus Ferrari, Ford versus right? Ferrari, incredible chapter. One it's of an the amazing greatest, movie. One of the greatest yeah, Christian seasons. Christian Bale. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if, you, if you like and appreciate uh, the ESPN uh, series that they did on, um, what is it, Four Days in October? Uh -huh. The story of the Red Sox coming back on the Yankees. I think it's called that. Is that the right I thing? I think you're Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. No, you're right. It breaks my heart, but yeah. I think that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, then you'll like Ford versus Ferrari because never mind F1, you come to understand the two teams that were there, but the real movie to real love is Rush. Ron Howard did. Really? It. You like that movie? Yeah. Rush, that was uh, James Hunt versus Nicky Lauda, one of the greatest F1, F1 years of all time. Yeah. Yeah, they, ho they made it for Hollywood. They did some things for Hollywood. Do you like the documentary on Netflix? Do you like the documentary they're doing for Formula One racing? Oh, Drive to Survive? Yeah. I think they do a good job of Drive to Survive. But it's like reality programming. They take the parts of each year with combustible personalities. Right. And it's like hard crap. knocks for racing, basically, right? It, yes. Yeah. Yes, except they have to be, I think, a little more creative. So what's the difference between Formula One racing and NASCAR? Because I'm going to be dead honest with you. I'm not a huge racing guy, but I know a lot of my, my fans and friends like NASCAR. Is there a, is there a difference? I mean, I know there is a difference, but NASCAR, they're going around in a circle for forever. Right. What is the, what is the appeal for people that don't get it? So, so Formula One is a bit of a parade the last several years, and so that part of it is kind of boring. Right. Um, NASCAR is what they're almost, almost a spec series. What a spec series is where all the cars are, like, identical, and you do some minor tuning, and then it's really a lot up to the driver, like almost all up to the driver. Whereas in NASCAR, you build to a spec, but you build your car. Right. And there's a lot of very careful measurements and the inspections and everything that come with that. But the racing in NASCAR is phenomenal. The, the 
you look at the over the course of the race, the amount of passes, the amount of action you see, and I think those cars are almost too safe because yeah. I don't I don't want to see anybody injured. But they think nothing of the kind of moves that cause you've seen it. Well, uh, cause mechanical mayhem and millions of dollars of cars get bent all up, and then we restart the race again and go with who's left. I actually don't like that part of NASCAR. I don't think that the that the zero risk accident and it's not people say oh you know what you're talking about biz doc <clears throat> it's not zero risk no but it's damn near zero risk these days sure but also when you're racing in a stadium what is the appeal with that because they have to start and stop every two seconds so i mean i feel like i'm watching people park their cars every every three seconds you know what <laughs> i mean going around the corner Ray, do you know what yeah. i'm talking about yeah. if they race at usc the uh not just recently and I, I tuned in for a second, then I tuned out because I was, it looked like these guys literally were just going around my neighborhood. Yeah, no, that and too. And I was going to say, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here. At least NASCAR, you don't see really younger. I don't see younger kids in NASCAR. I know 16-year-olds in F1 or, you know, Formula One or 18-year-old kids 18 -year -old that, are, kids. that yep. are phenomenal well, not drivers. Quite that. You're talking about Formula Two, but there's some yeah. pretty young guys. You know, there's a... Uh, there's like young kids that are in the... driver had appendicitis two weeks ago. And their backup driver finished eighth. It shows yeah, that was good. Young kid yeah. in school. It shows you how good and how just shows you how good the depth is. There was a cool yeah. video that came out of him returning to school, and all his classmates were like standing up, clapping for him. He came back you like a conquering hero. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Isn't that crazy? Hey, I'm Tom, Tom, what'd you do that. this weekend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Hey, Tom, I drove for Ferrari. I made yeah. a half a million so, dollars. Yeah. What'd you do? So speaking of <laughs> Tom, speaking of Ferrari, I want to revisit something you touched on a couple minutes ago about like big personalities in NASCAR. Ferrari signed one of the biggest personalities in NASCAR uh, in Lewis Hamilton just a couple of weeks ago. Can you tell me about how big a move that was? Like. Well, what, what's he, a he went from um, he actually went from Mercedes F1, and he's got seven world championships. Has won more races, more poles than anybody in history. Although if Max Verstappen just keeps just dealing dealing wins like he's dealing cards, um, that's going to change. But um, for Lewis to go to Ferrari, I think there's a couple things going on there. I think Mercedes is now about to really make full bet on their their number two driver, uh, George. This, this kid is really, really, really good. And so I think they're gonna make that bet and Lewis is into his 40s. And then no one, no one doesn't wanna play for Ferrari yeah. in, in Formula One. They all wanna do someday. It's kinda like saying, would you ever like to play for the Yankees? Every ball player will probably tell you, they want to play for the Dodgers. They want to play for the Yankees. They want to, and you could put, in terms of raw prestige, you could put Boston in there very much. But there's not, it's like in the NFL, who would you absolutely want to play for? For Brady, don't say the Chiefs. For don't say the Chiefs. The Cowboys. Don't you say it's the Cowboys. Cowboys. No, right? it's a fact. Tom, this guy's yeah. a diehard for Bra Chiefs For Brady, fan. it's the LA Lakers in basketball. And let me ask you, <laughs> hey, Lewis is one of like the few guys that really transcends the sport. I mean, like I know myself, I'm not a huge racing guy but i mean i've known of lewis hamilton for 15 years now he's got the most wins at 103 fashion yeah. he's yeah he's right a fashion icon yeah for sure he he started out like the joke was when he was old enough to date the first thing he was dating was um nicole kidman scherzinger scherzinger Oof. right she Where'd was one of the. Out? I guess yeah. so I heard of Lewis Hamilton. Was she, was she a pussycat doll or yeah, a spice yeah, yeah, yeah. girl? She was a, probably both. I don't know, but she yeah, was a judge was... on one of those like singing competitions. Does it matter? No, it no, was no, uh, the yeah. Masked Singer. That's what she was. I, I thought she was with anyway. No, so no, if no, you no. had to compare him to anyone, was he more like the Michael Jordan of racing? Is he more like the uh, David Beckham? Beckhamish? Is he the kind Beckham? of figure? I think. Yeah, he's he's sort of a well, he's he's got all the stats. Right. So you know what Lewis Hamilton really is? He's like LeBron James. Okay. He's come after the greats. He's got a ton of the stats, but not everybody wants to say he's better than Mike. Is that a Chris? And that's Chris Michael Schumacher. Okay. So yeah. in the NBA, it's Michael Jordan, right? right? Of course. You know what? Is he? Yeah. You know, oh, he's got all the stats, but you know, is LeBron better than Jordan? I don't know. I'm not ready to do that. So it seems like a bit like the Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi like relationship, where <clears throat> you know they're both the same. Messi and and Ronaldo. Until both he took won a, a check, of... walked off the field at the World <laughs> Cup, and Messi won the thing. Messi yeah. did. And everybody yeah. said, "Are we done here? <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Is that it? Is 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 basically Messi is Messi the goat? Uh, well, as of right say, now, yeah. it's yeah, tough, to, tough to argue. He won, right? the, I mean, he won the World Cup. World Cup and, like the last and, thing on and his another, box. and then he comes out here, sh uh, you know, um, uh, scores on the set play yeah. on the first game he's in, right. and then also wins his uh, seventh or eighth Ballon d'Oro. Yeah. 
What was that? that? It's like the Heisman yeah. of soccer. Belinda Oro. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the name of the race? No, yeah. no. Isn't that the? Yeah, that's that's the award that isn't they that... give to the best soccer player on the planet. Somebody help me. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, you you're good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You did it better than us. I thought it was. I thought, it was, ra- I thought it was racing. Yeah. No, no, no. That's the. Yeah, no. That's like the. <laughs> that's like the recognition of the yeah. soccer player of the year. Got you on Mondial. Mm-hmm. Yep. Got you. Yep. Uh, did you ever? Have you ever? Have you like? Is there any other sport that you've played growing up that you appreciate just as much as racing? Do you? Do you love watching soccer? Do you love watching baseball, basketball? Which one gets you thrilled? So I, I ran cross country in high school, but I wasn't. I wasn't part of the team. I ran with the team. I wasn't good enough to even be on that team, and I, I never played any, any of the traditional team sports. You know, I was young, 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 young. I played little league, but that was right. that. You know. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Well, I, look, I want to. Can I shift gears to my the sport that I love so Please. much? And yeah, by look, all means. The so I want to talk to you about because nobody knows it better. The NFL salary cap has jumped 30.6 million, the largest ever from season to season. Good call. And I've been real. Two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars, and year. I've been yeah. a big look. Is it point I, four? Like point four? Two fifty-five point four? Yeah, something like that. There's a joke. Two hundred fifty-five point four. Don't forget the kicker. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and four hundred grand a year for a kicker. Yeah, we need a uh, third-string kicker. Here's right. four hundred. And if you're the well, Cowboys, that's priority number one. Well, what I think, <laughs> what I think's happening is, oh, and yeah, I know she's true. she's gotten a ton of hate throughout the year. But how much of that do you attribute to Taylor Swift bringing a whole new demographic and a Good hundreds question, of Mano. thousands of eyes to the product? Good question. I, well, is there so, so we got to loop it around. Yeah, please. They only negotiate the NFL TV agreements so often. But when those agreements get negotiated, that's really what's driving salary cap. Um, mm-hmm. And then the fallout from those. <clears throat> Was it amazing that Taylor Swift is drawing, literally, demonstrably drawing eyeballs. Yeah, that's amazing. And maybe that was some of it, but I think the salary cap thing was, was in play for a while. But it's, it's tremendous. You now have a quarter billion dollars. You know, remember, what did the joke used to be about salary? If you want to be on TV, play in the NFL. If you want the viewers, right? If you want viewers, go to the NFL. If you want the check, go baseball. to the NBA. Oh. And if you want the fun, go to baseball. Interesting. Right? I never heard that. No, but yeah. the, among players, right? Gotcha. Right. You okay. know, because you, you look look at look at the players that don't look at the when the pitchers, the starting pitchers aren't playing. Look at them in the dugout during the game. Look at how everybody's kind of loose. Right? Yeah, they're all 162 games. I'm not really wound up. No. Whereas the NFL, this is week eight. Yeah. Man, we could be 10 and we could be a, a you know 11 and six and miss the playoffs. Week eight's important. But right. do you think do you think sure. do you think there's too much? Do you think there's too much in terms of baseball games? Too much um, with uh, NFL because now they're talking about bringing on another uh, another week, they're right? Kicking around the idea of an 18th game, but but, I, but also for Tom, what? F- yeah, exactly. You for know what? Because exactly I thought what? we expanded wild card, we added a couple games, right? Right. And now it's and like player safety is something that they're trying to harp on. At the same time, they try to add games every year, which is kind of a you know interestingly ironic. Well, and you know, then I think the game within the game is. Move the salary cap up to get them happy about the. Um, there it is. About yeah, being paid point. for ad- additional games, right. but don't move it in line. Right. Right. Uh, and, and back to the Taylor Swift thing, uh, Tom. Do you think it was good for football, or do you think it was bad for football? Well, obviously, it brought in more revenue. It also brought in another demographic for females from 18 to 35. But also, it, it made me want to turn the TV off every time I saw T. Swift in the box. You know what I'm saying? Well, so is it a catch-22? Is it, is it, is, you tell me. So I think there's three things there. Number one, um, a lot of people, including my wife, are like, please, there's a game going on. Right? They cut away that luxury box. She's jumping up and down. Please, there's a game, there's a game going on. Hello? The, um, she's a Niner fan, so you understood. The <clears throat> point one. Point two. Anything that brings attention to it that's not bad attention, like a running back beating up a girl in an elevator. Right. You know, right. Um, that's bad A attention. Ray Rice move, if you will. Yeah, I wasn't going to sure. name him. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that's negative attention. That's the attention they don't want. Right. Um, 60 Minutes talking about CTE. Yeah. You know, uh, Drew Brees and people being interviewed after they come back on their surfboards after um, the, um, they did the, the traditional – paddle out for junior sale okay you know and they talk about how he felt and what mm-hmm. happened and mental CTE. illness yep and they don't want that attention nope but pop 
star bringing yeah, yeah. people to watch games. Yep. They're happy about that attention. And then the third the third angle is it, you know, it it's, it, you know, you're trying to shift the demographic. And so if you get more women to turn in, then that's good. So you have attention that's good attention. You get viewership. You maybe get more women to tune in. So do you think maybe, any, uh, maybe th that way it's good, even though my wife and all of us are like, please, we just cut back to the game. Do you think it had to do at all with a certain pharmaceutical company? Uh, you plugging that it. at all? And it, trust me, I saw your face, it, Tom, Brady. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say it because we want to air this episode. But do you think, Tom, the, do you think there was any play there in terms of introducing that? Because, by the way, that commercial came out the day she was also put into the press box or into the uh, suite. <clears throat> well, do I think that's all interrelated, that they do a big – that a company does a product endorsement with a guy – that's got big money behind it. Right. And then there's a tension on that player and his girlfriend. Do I think there's a circle of life there? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. There's an economic circle there. What do you got, Chris? And look, I'm on record being pretty hard on the NFL and how they handled the whole thing. But they did, if they were conscious of one thing, it was that every week by week by week, we did notice that our airtime did go down. So I think she got something like 17 seconds in the Super Bowl by the time that rolled around. So I think they did notice that people like your wife pounding were starting to get a little going like this and pounding. Yeah, yeah. Her. People like your wife were starting to get a little uh, you know, a little immune to it and they decided to, you know, take that into consideration. I think they did a better job with it at the end. For and sure. can I ask you a question now about a, a keep with the salary cap, keep with the same team? Uh, just something maybe you can break down a little bit because the salary cap is something weird. There's ways to maneuver it and structure it to kind of help benefit your team a bit better. We saw Mahomes a couple of weeks ago renegotiate or restructure his contract to free up $21 million that afforded the Chiefs the ability to now sign Hollywood Brown and perhaps keep Legereus Sneed. Mm -hmm. Now, what's, talk, talk to me about how there's so much money there, but like the importance of having a good cap guy to help you really manipulate that cap properly and afford you the ability to move money around. Yeah, so you, you might think of it this way. Think of it as that you've got a credit card. This is how I want America to think about the salary cap. You have a credit card with a limit, and you buy things. And let's say you're buying things that, that you want everything that you bought to still work. A cell phone, a fridge, a, a dryer, washer dryer. Let's just think of it as your house. Okay. And let's say that before you ever pay off the credit card, some of that crap breaks. The freezer in the garage breaks and then you buy to buy a new freezer, but you haven't paid off the freezer that's on your credit card. That is exactly what happens in the NFL. You get all these contracts, and then you do guaranteed money, and then sometimes, sometimes the freezer breaks, known as your starting left tackle. Right. But you gotta pay him. And then you find out that he can't play anymore. But you still have a guaranteed contract, and now you have what's called dead cap space. Right. Like, what am I going to do with this? I'm still paying it. So having an accountant and a general manager working together on what's guaranteed, what's not, what are you doing? You know what was really interesting to me? The Kansas City Chiefs are number 31 next to last in dead cap space. They only have $5.9 million in right. dead cap, right. which means... Either they're amazingly good, and Clark Hunt, who I think owns it, yes, son right. of Lamar Hunt, yep. yeah. either his gang and his actuaries it's, and his team yeah, physicians that, that's Brit Veach. are yeah, married, fantastic with it. are just amazingly good right. at doing contracts that aren't guaranteed, or they're just good at keeping people healthy. And there is that in the NFL. There's yeah. teams that are good at keeping you healthy, and there's teams that can't give a damn. Well, and, and they also they have a coach in Andy Reid who's been around forever, so he's been able to try and – and maneuver different things over the, now he knows what's worked. He's been around long enough to see what doesn't work. I'm sure he structures practices in a right way, yeah. camp in a right way to kind of preserve these guys' bodies. So, and yep. now that, let me ask you this. So, But I'll, I'll take you one more deeper. Please. Sure. But the Dallas Cowboys at minus 5 million that they have to free up, Atlanta Falcons at minus 6, and the Kansas City Rams at minus 3. Those are the number th one, two, three at the bottom that have to free up cap space or they can't sign anybody. So in other words, the Chiefs 
with 5.9 in dead cap means very little dead cap mm -hmm. means they have signed everybody they can sign and they're actually kind of upside down based on raises promised players so they either have to trade people Legarius Sneed cut people right. that are on non-guaranteed contracts right. so you're cutting you don't get it right. to do that and that's the other half of what you were properly saying as somebody that manages the cap or you have to have a winner that wants to keep on winning like a Magic Johnson, a Tom Brady, right. and now Perfect. Patrick Mahomes right. that says, I'll tell you what, why don't you pay me till I'm 42 and I'll move the money along in such a way that you're actually only paying me so much per year, but you have to make the money when I'm 42 guaranteed. So in that case, I'll take the deal right. and I'll, I'll allow you to sign a, a wide receiver, but it has to go longer and be guaranteed. That's the power of the star player. All right, and to kind of put a bow on that. That's what you're talking about. Yes, yep. exactly. And they've been talking a lot about, think about a team like the Jets where they invest a big piece of the cap in an Aaron Rodgers who gets hurt four plays in. People have been kicking around the idea perhaps when a guy goes on a season-ending list being able to maybe scrub that money from the cap and give them the ability to sign somebody in that place. What do you think about something like that? Well, so the players' union would love that. The, the NFL would say... This only takes one drunk, irresponsible owner and GM to put a franchise in trouble. Sure. And, we've, and there have been franchises in trouble in baseball. There were franchises in trouble in basketball, certainly in hockey, <clears throat> that are like, wait a minute. So do you want to let a, a GM and a owner say, win at all costs? Yep. And so do some crazy ass things and then say, well, the NFL will let us scrub it. If, if that's the case, then you really don't have a salary cap anymore. You, 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 have audit, you have this irresponsibility index. It's like saying, well, if I max out my credit card, maybe my dad will let me borrow 10 grand. <laughs> yeah. Would you do, it's like, would the other good teams that are well-managed go, wait, 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 wait. That idiot can bid up a dumb contract on an older player that has a bad ankle to sell season tickets. Right. And whoops, he's hurt and he's out, or their doctor, wink, wink, says he can't play anymore. That's, that's what I think is the biggest issue there. Yeah. So, Tom, let me ask you. So, um, Chris, did you have anything else? Do you want to talk about No, that was good. That was okay, great. cool. Um, Caleb Williams is projected to be the number one pick for the Chicago Bears, my Chicago Bears, and uh, I'm excited about it. But with my question to you, Tom, is with these guys that get all this money with the NIL, um, what do you, real quick, what do you think about a rookie contract? Do you think these guys deserve this much money coming out of college? Or do you think, it, uh, you think it's warranted and, you know, they, they play up to what they make? Or how would, you, how would you, do you think these guys deserve that much money out the gate? Hey, it's a economic game, right? Sure. So there are prevailing averages in most sports for seated draft picks right? right for high seated draft picks and they'll tell you i mean that was the whole um <clears throat> so they give billy bean a lot of credit for Moneyball, but you have to give also a lot of credit in football to um Malik, will you pull up his stat or jimmy johnson caleb williams throwing the ball jimmy johnson's draft r room that conceived the um ev a evolved notion of the value of draft picks when they traded herschel walker right and they got the stack of picks that became the cowboys of the 80s Right. Remember that? Yeah, of course. So I think it's a supply and demand game, and I think uh, the guys deserve it. You talk about NAL. It was very interesting. Uh, not long ago, um, Pat and I had dinner in L.A. with Stephen A. Smith. And I won't speak for Stephen A. Stephen A. can speak for himself on NAL. Incredibly intelligent guy. Of course. A lot of insights. Yep. But we talked very briefly at dinner, and my position was, you know, do you want a young kid at 18, 19 years old becoming quickly disillusioned and maybe bribed by boosters to run from one college to another? That's what I'm saying. And on one side, Stephen A. correctly pointed out, and then he can speak for himself on this. He said, look, some of these kids, this now enables maybe them and their family to get to an economic place, and they are 
hey, babe, that was their picture on the high school program. Right. That's their picture here. That's their jersey and their name being sold. So money is being made off of them in the increasingly big game of Friday Night Light high school athletics and the hugely profitable multi-billion dollar game of college football where we've got take the top 10 college coaches that are paid, take the top 10 NFL coaches being paid, and guess what? <laughs> you know, you're, <clears throat> sometimes it's better to be a coach in college, right? Totally. So you, you look at all that, and I didn't want the kids to be tempted. Stephen A felt this, and I agreed with Stephen A, and he can speak for himself, but I think that it creates issues within the game that are unintended consequences that I don't think that a lot of people saw coming. And recently, the the goat of coaches even said is your retirement kind of led to some things he said i had kids that didn't want to talk about education and stuff you see his quote that's yeah. exactly where i was going to go with it next. go with yeah. that tell me tell, him, tell us well, what he said yeah, i was going to go him. just just the whole i think that talk whole, about saving right yeah, yeah exactly what did he I, say it was i think like, that whole um situation is i think you're going to see a lot more of these big time coaches now i think shashevsky the same way obviously these guys have been in it forever and we're probably ready to leave but i've heard them both say that that could be a bit of what pushed them out when you are making what you're making but now your quarterback is making four million dollars more than you you almost lose that ability to sort of coach him a certain way because he because, because he has kind of all the leverage in a way right the the player the player well then the player you have to worry about keeping him happy then because year two especially in college football where you have to stay minimum three you, you get a guy like a caleb williams who go to a different school the next year because right. they'll shell out a little bit more scratch for them. You know what it's, I mean? Yeah, Tom, say, so say you're drafting a, a quarterback, and then we got to move on, but uh, you're drafting a quarterback. The guy wears dresses. He paints his nails. Social media is a whole thing now. It's not what it used to be. And aside, aside from money, does the extracurricular stuff scare you to take this guy at number one? Does that stuff mess you up at all? I, you know, to be an owner in professional sports – if he's wearing that at the combine, he's probably not going to run a, a 4 3 40. No, I would assume he'd probably, he'd probably get in the way. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> yes. And if he does, by the but way, by the way draft his and ass. if he can run a 4 3 40 in heels, I can't wait to get go. him in cleats and pads. There you go, Tom. Look at there he is. Now listen, I don't that's mind your, my quarter, I don't mind my that's quarterback. Your first pick. Fine. That's your first listen, pick, I get emotional after the show because we're hanging out with Tom. You know, it's, you're sitting with royalty. <laughs> but you know, I'm saying Caleb Williams when you're wearing dresses and you're running in high heels, like Tom said, which he didn't. But I mean, I don't know. For me, that would be somewhat of a red flag. But if he can throw that ball 60 yards, Malik, you have that from his pro day. Did you see this, Tom, at his <clears> pro day? How far did he throw it, Chris? He threw 60. He threw 20 to 20, but Watch with, this throw, with Tom. very little effort. Tom, watch this. Here we go. Obviously, he has no one coming at him, but he's throwing from yeah. Yeah, yeah, the 20s. He doesn't have on shoulder pads either. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Look at and that. And this is a throw, though, that it's weird the way the NFL is works now. But take a look at Would he ever make that throw in the NFL except at the end of the half? I, I mean, if he's, no, doing if a, he's oh, got his nails he's got, painted, then yeah. yes. Yeah. If, if, if he's got Tyree Kill you know. running some of these burners on the outside, you're seeing a little bit more. Watch back there. This is, the, this is a Hail Mary drop back. He's doing, uh, uh, that's uh, exactly uh, right. Well, that's the One, thing about pro days. That's exactly right. That's the thing about pro days They call and the combine. They call them the underwear Olympics. Like everybody looks good in shorts and a T-shirt. And that's why I make such a big stink about are there when they say, he didn't throw at the combine, and Marvin Harrison didn't run. Is it is it a big deal to me? And I say no because the game is, you know, game yeah. film is king. I don't know. I'm just so. I'm curious from Tom's take because, you know, some of these guys do get caught up in the social media world. And I'm just curious if I'm going to give this guy so much money. Is that a factor? Well, I'm glad. That, I, I got to confess. Uh, I'm glad there wasn't social media all the time. Yes. Uh, when my daughter was really young, I took her mani-pedi, get her of course. manicure, pedicure. Yeah. And, and she said, Dad, are you... Go with me, so I went with me, put my hands up, and they gave me a pedicure. You know, so but you know that's that's, that's what that's what you do as a good dad. And and I had the lady, lady, she put Ferrari flags on my two big toes. Oh, so that's she painted my big toes. So Guys, I was cue the picture. So no, I was joking. walking around. I was walking <laughs> around flip flops for two weeks with Ferrari flags on my big toes, but yeah. they were Ferrari flags. Yeah. So I guess it's okay. I'm gonna. Do th uh, <laughs> Which one? I did that once, and then, uh, yeah, that was that. I, want to do, I have one more thing I want to ask you just real quick, and then we'll get to Mano Otani. I wanted to talk to you about – can you pull up the Tom Brady, Kirk Cousins thing? <laughs> I thought this was really interesting because Tom Brady, in 23 seasons, Kirk Cousins only played 16. Tom Brady has 35 playoff wins. Uh, Kirk Cousins has one. 
Tom, look at that and break that down if you can. Or just why is Kirk Cousins getting four hundred and twelve million dollars and Tom got three hundred thirty three? Obviously, Tom made more in endorsements. I don't see Kirk Cousins getting those endorsement deals like Tom did. But how does a guy that only has one playoff win get four hundred twelve million dollars more than Tom Brady? Okay, I'll answer that real quick. Great. All right, Malik, look up yeah. while we're doing this. Yeah. Career earnings, Chan Ho Park. And then look up career earnings, Justin Verlander. Oh, good call. Very okay. good call. So, um, so what happens here, number one, Kirk Cousins played in the more modern era on more progressive TV contracts. Um, number two, you know, um, Brady didn't exert his leverage because I think he was really committed to winning, and Brady's off-field endorsements were such to the point that I think, how greedy can you be? Because uh, Brady is a businessman. He's not going to take less than he's owed, but it was a little bit of a different era. And until they had that falling out, I mean, if, if you would ask, okay, ask Kirk Cousins, would you take Tom Brady's contract and want to play in that season where except for a, a certain David Tyree, you were going to have the perfect season? Yeah. Would you take that shot, shot and take those? Kirk Cousins is going to say, yeah. Because, look, these guys take home about 45% of this. Right. You know, agent, business manager, taxes, jock tax based on the states where they play. You know how that works. And so they get about 45% of this. And if they don't, if they don't snort it or do things that are crazy, Oof. they're probably putting... You know, on a ten million dollar contract, you put five million a year away. Ten million dollar contract's not a big, big one anymore for an no. NFL quarterback. No. So that's five million a year. Five million, five million, five million. So four years, you're putting away twenty million dollars at five percent interest rate today. Yeah, that's two and a half million dollars a year. <clears throat> After taxes, that's a hundred grand a month. Yep. So let's put it in perspective. Totally. You know, so at certain point in time, they have all the toys, they have the house, they have everything going on, and it's all about winning. And so I think it was just a different time for Kirk Cousins, and he's getting the bigger contracts. He's got owners that are so desperate for the position. Yeah. Tom Brady has caused the Kirk Cousins contract. He does. Yeah, he did, for sure. Okay, now, career earnings of Chan Ho Park. Oh, yeah. Do you have that? Chan Ho Park and, and uh, Verlander? Yep. There we go. Chan Ho Park, five years, $65 million. No, no, that's, that's one contract. That's one contract. Yeah. Oh, my. Look at his career earnings, Chan Ho Park. So he played a couple different teams, too. Or was he just one team? I think Chan Ho Park was for the Rangers, right? Played for the Rangers. And then I believe he was the Yankees, too, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> played for the Dodgers where he started. Yeah, he this, played for the Dodgers as well. Like on That's a rookie right. contract. Became yep. Interesting. Yeah, because anyway, we'll, guys... find it. we'll find it. But anyway, yeah, we'll come back compare to Chan Ho Chris, Park to Justin Verlander and say, what the hell? Yeah. Now, and then take the last three years off Justin Verlander because he's had these three – you know, you win, you win the way he's done, and you can say, you know, I want to make decisions on X. I want a cyber truck. I want right. a lot of things. And you give it to him. Who doesn't want yeah. a cyber truck? Chris, go ahead. Yeah, Tom hit it right on the head. Uh, Brady, he's a f uh, forward thinker, man. He understood that with taking a little bit of a haircut every year, he afforded himself the privilege of having a better supporting cast, and that with winning and that, you know, status comes more money. So he was smart enough, like, like he said, to just see – See it for you know. See it ahead of time. Understand that with seven titles comes other things that other people who don't win like that are going to get on the back end. And that was such a super smart decision by him. I mean, we've seen it in other sports. Uh, Tim Duncan notoriously always took less money. Dirk Nowitzki took less money. LeBron took less money to come down here. So it's not the first time people have done it. But yeah, he won at just an astronomical level. Where on the back end, just being Tom Brady affords him the ability to make money forever. You know, well, speaking, and off field, yeah. he's got a yeah. three hundred million dollar media contract just waiting for him. Tell he's me, never been in a booth. Of course. Tell me what he makes off the field as a one-time Super Bowl winning contract when he beat the Rams, and that's all he does. Tell me what the endorsements look like for the rest of his career versus when he was a two-time. Sure. Then he was a three-time. Of right. course. Then he was a four-time. Right. What did that contract with – who was he with? He was with Uggs. He had amazing – Yeah. Mm -hmm. he had everyone amazing made fun of him for, Everyone contracts. made fun of him for Uggs, too, and he yeah. made a and fortune just, off it. He does, yes, He exactly. just hurts now, yeah, you know, I think. And, and My dad came down for Christmas. Yeah. What do those contracts look like right. if he's not a two-time, three-time right. Super Bowl winner? 
Yeah. And his guys love him, you know, yeah. and as a quarterback, to get your, your guys paid is huge, too. And speaking of crazy contracts, uh, Tom, I, we have to pick your brain on this one, this even though it's sort of old news, but the Shohei Otani uh, deal that's going on. Do you want to break down the contract? Yeah, break down the contract quick. So obviously we know 700 total, $2 million a year for 10 years, $68 million from 2034 to 2043. Now, you got to kind of understand the structure of the contract before we talk about what's going on right now. Uh, as of yesterday, Shohei Otani's best friend and his interpreter, his name is Ipe Mazuhara, and he was fired by the Dodgers for what they're calling stealing over $4 million. Yeah, now, bullshit, this is the crazy bullshit. thing, right? The contract in it, first, they're saying it, it was stolen on betting, right? Now, first, what bookie affords a four, four, interpreter four a, four point, a $4 million like hit. debt yeah. and continues to allow them to bet, right? Second, there's a, there's a clause in this contract that states if specific change in Dodger personnel occurs, the player may opt out of the contract at the end of that season. Now, let me be clear. I don't know 100% there's a disclaimer, so don't kill me in the comments. Uh, I'm not sure if Mizuhara is included in that, in that clause, so he may not be. I would assume he has to be, though, if he's his interpreter. I don't know. But think about how crazy something like that is. Like, and now you, know, you almost have to worry. This might become one of the biggest stories in sports because you have to almost worry, where does the betting and Otani kind of marry one another? What did he know? Does, it, does it have anything to do with his games? I guarantee you he won't have to do anything with his contract because he's – the Michael Jordan of baseball as we speak. Oh, don't guarantee at the that, man. I don't know, it, it, because what do you do? You, you're going to tell the guy to go... Um, you're gonna tell it may to go be over his head. It might not be a Dodgers situation anymore. You see Pete Rose is out of baseball forever. The greatest hitter of... Yeah, one but of the I'm saying Shohei Otani's in his prime. They're not going to do anything to this Pete guy. Pete Rose so, is the hit king in Major League but Baseball history. They're going to put it They're going to put it right under the rug, dude. They're going to sweep it, it right it's, under. It Tom, what do you think? One of those so doesn't work like that. The guys they're talking about is controlling owner Mark Walther. There's a syndicate that owns the Dodgers, Guggenheim Group. Mark Walther is a key part of that overall syndicate. And so he's controlling owner. And then the other one is uh, president of baseball operations, Andrew Friedman, who Andrew Friedman is the GM of the Dodgers. There is a GM of the Dodgers, but Andrew Friedman uses his team, his folks differently. Right. So the G and by the way, which is why, you know, Zaidi is up at San Francisco, um, took the GM job up there. So basically, if those one of those two people, Otani said to the interpreter, if one of those two people are gone, he has an opt out clause in the contract. Now, he may not opt out, but right. he then has an opt out clause. Right. Yeah, the freedom to move if he wants to. So. so in other words, if the Dodgers were sold to some crazy international syndicate, like um, fictitious sample. So let's say some giant oil syndicate buys professional golf, just hypothetically. Um, and like live? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So let's say I you're going to say it. Let's say a giant international syndicate, you know, buys the Dodgers. Right. Because they're owned by Guggenheim Partners, a PE firm, and they're offered a bunch of money. And they said, well, this is where we guess what? This is where we cash out and monetize the investment. Woohoo. Go us. <clears throat> OK. They do that. Right. And then Otani's like, I don't know if I want to play for ownership that's a syndicate in the Middle East. I'm not sure if I like that anymore. He has an opt-out clause. Right. So there's your example. Interesting. And then Andrew Friedman, and, you know, they got to win another world championship because they've been so close so often. It's like last year, I just don't think – I think they had injuries at the wrong time. Yeah. Pitching was weird last year. But the year before, I thought they should have defended the title, and I didn't think Dave Roberts had the team ready. But I think this year they're they're primed. Yeah, yeah, they're loaded. Top they're to primed. bottom. I mean, top Freddie to bottom. Freeman. They got the addition of Yamamoto this year. Oh my god! What do you think about Mookie Betts? Yamamoto. Moving? Yamamoto got destroyed today. Yeah, I know. I think it's you know, gonna, they had the Soul Series, and I think he gave up five runs in the first inning today. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the Soul Series. I too. think he's. I think he's catching his footing. I think it's yeah, a little bit different it's with a the MLB. Different game. And players think, are yeah, better. As he, as he yeah. starts cooking, I think right. he'll be all right. What but, do you think? Hey, by the way, hey, you see here how he was booed in Korea. Yeah. You know why? Why? Because. If you think the Irish and the British get into it, like soccer games, Korea and Japan, they really get into oh, it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Wow. What do you think the influx of, um, of Korean and um, Asian players coming into the big leagues? Because uh, right now it looks like there's, it's doubling every year um, in terms of American-made sort of baseball players. It's not as appealing it seems like because Mano and I talked about it recently yeah, on one we, of our we um, and we'll move on after this. But or another see, another another thought is maybe international 
organizations in baseball are getting better. Totally. And they're on par with American baseball. I mean, you look at Yamamoto, he was a three-time winner of the Japanese equivalent of the Cy Young. Right. right. And you looked at the movement on his pitches, and you looked at his velocity, and you look at the number of pitches he threw and the Japanese game, and you're like, that's why the Dodgers gave him that contract. Not because, hey, maybe he can play here. No. It's he can play the game and he can throw the ball. Of course, yeah, he belongs here. What do you got, Chris? And we we talked about the influx of Asian players coming over here and the reason why it's happening now as opposed to how it used to at such a higher rate where the the Asian teams used to own the rights of a player for the duration of their baseball life. And the uh, MLB oh, got had, rid of that. You had to send the equivalent of European soccer rental. Yeah, it was right? a, a fortune just to try to acquire the rights to one of these guys. But, you know, the MLB allowed free agency to be a thing now in the 90s. And now the Asian countries are kind of catching on and they've kind of made that made that. Yeah, well, because they see, they, they see the appeal of the big leagues. They see the appeal of what we have going on over here and everyone right. wants a piece. Right. I think sometimes I think we get a little spoiled with our social media and we get desensitized and we don't see what the bigger picture is. And that is if you go to the show, which is the MLB, that is the prize. And a lot of these guys look at the money. They look at everything they get on the outside of what it takes to be a great baseball player. And that's what I think is the reason why you see the influx of Asian players, European players, from the NBA to the to the MLB. And, and the best athletes on the planet want to challenge themselves with the best players on the planet. So right. being over there and being the best guy is phenomenal. But right. you always have that curiosity, like how would I have done if I played in the biggest, you know, the For biggest sure. league? Malik, what do you got? Yeah, speaking of Asian baseball players, I uh, I found that uh, the guy's career earning the Chan Ho Park. Oh, you got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay, pull it up. Let's see what we got. And then we're going to move on to a little bit of basketball because i got to pick Tom's brain because I'm trying to win some money on this bracket. What do you got there? Yep. She was 100 million. It was uh, 88.9, it looks like. Yeah. During and his uh, so 19 year Landers career. Well. Yeah. Look at all of us with bad eyes. I thought you were going to pull up because I thought he had earned it. Exactly. There we go. There we go. He had earned exactly $100 million in his career. What has Justin Verlander earned? Well, Justin Verlander also, though, he won World Series. He won, you know. Right. I think he won two. But I'm saying if you Multiple take Justin Verlander's against, career earnings and you subtract the last three years, mm -hmm. career earnings is 350, but you take the last three years, yeah. it's 250. Well, the last three so years, you're telling me that Justin Verlander is only 2.5 times as, yeah. as valuable as Chan. Yeah, that doesn't, Park. That's, that's just, I guess, it's, Tom, is that just how it goes sometimes? That's just the way the ball bounces? What? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, and or he, it's he, just the way, just the way the GM and the and the owner are thinking on one day. Right. I think he'll do good for us. It's a different right. world. They talk themselves into paying crazy. Yeah. Um, Chris, do you have anything to touch on? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to NCAA. No, let's do it. Let's talk against the clock. Yeah, let's talk uh, hoops. Tom, let's talk hoops. Let's talk. Let's talk March Madness. Let's talk cheddar. Uh, people that want to. Well, the bracket you've already, the brackets are already filled out, but I'm curious as your take. Can we watch just a little? bit of uh, Tom's podcast, The Biz Doc, at the 16-minute mark. Tom broke it down for us really well that I didn't think about um, in terms of when you're picking your brackets, what's a smart move and a smart way to do it. In the first round, and then they say at the end of the first round, I've only got four of them right. My bracket is completely busted. Okay, here we go. First round, one versus 16. Just circle all the ones and be done with it. Next, two versus 15, only 11 losses in history. Three versus 14, 14 team tournament. Yeah. 22 losses in history. Just select all of your one, twos, and threes, and look at this, 85, 92, 98% of the time, you're right. Brady, you're gonna have a great parlay. Now, for sure. Picks up a little bit, 32 losses. Boom, 5-12. Two to one. Every 50, year. 50, 50, 50. It's 106, 99, about two to one. Now you only have a 65% chance. This is where it gets interesting here in the middle. Six versus 11. Almost a, you know, a little bit, little bit worse odds. So basically, isn't that interesting? Look at the 11 has had that. And 7, 10. Look at this. 5, 6, 7 versus 10, 11, 12. This is where you get it right. And if you so get on your bracket, right, pick one five, one six, one seven. All right, so wins. stop it, Malik. Wait. Stop right there. So Tom, in a nutshell, can you break that down for us? Yeah. So the people at home, this is a. And by the way, this is since this this, this record is since the uh, tournament was expanded to sixty four teams as we know it today. You know, with the you know the play in, you know the the four that play in, they you know the other eight that play in, and so basically this is a record in the first round. So when people talk about my brackets busted. 
You know, it's basically the one, two, three, four, just select all the ones, twos, threes, and fours, and you will probably lose one of those games on your sheet. And as of the time we got on air, only 10.8% of brackets remain perfect. So you see how fast they get exploded. Mine, I got, mean, mine got touched yeah, fast. I mean, well, well, the 611. BYU Duquesne, right? So BYU Duquesne probably blew up a million right there. I didn't pick Duquesne. And then at the math all. goes that your five, six, and sevens, which of the fives on your sheet do you like? Don't, you know, one, two, and three. And then one of the fives don't take it. And one of the sixes don't take it. And one of the sevens don't take right. it. You know, it's it's kind of the way it shakes out. Who do you now, have? which one is 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 the real issue? But I'm saying if the odds, if you if you've picked nothing but seeds and win loss records, it's kind of funny. Yeah, it 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 is kind of fun. It's it's funny and fun. Um, but Tom, do you have any do you have any sleepers for the people at home? Do you see anything that you're like I would take this team over so this I'm team? So I'm the wrong or? guy to ask because I'm not a student college basketball okay but i look back at the last two weeks with all the conference tournaments very carefully as i said okay and now i'll jinx it <laughs> but i got michigan state going all the way to the elite eight on no, that side but they're nine they're a nine seed <clears throat> yeah well i think they beat mississippi state they just i did. think they're gonna upset carolina who i think is the weakest one good i have Would them winning we agree? The whole th i have them winning the whole thing <laughs> carolina <laughs> Yeah, Carolina yes. didn't even win their conference. No tournament. one has UConn. Yeah, but I like Carolina is one of those teams that just turns it on in the tournament. Like, right, like let's, let's what, you want to yeah, just yeah, let's just talk Turkey real quick. Want to go we ten more elite, minutes? The want to go Elite Eight in? Yeah. When did you want to do? Who's got it? Do we have our brackets? Oh, the Elite Eight. In? Okay. Oh who's, yeah, I have. Oh, Final Four. Who's sure. your? I got Final Four. I got Duke. I got North Carolina. I got. Um, so call the seed on that. Duke. You got a four. Duke's four. I know Carolina's one. Uh, and then hold on one second. I have to think of my other two. Now I have a brain fart. Uh, let's see. I have it right here. Hold on one second. Um, so you got Duke upsetting Houston. I do. Yeah, Houston's yeah, and you nasty know what? this year. You want to know why I'm doing Houston that? Because Houston effed me last year. So I have a personal vendetta against them. <laughs> yeah, and Duke's down a point guard. There's all the reason in the world to think yeah, that'll Houston, happen. Houston's yeah. been real good the last couple years. Real tough, no, tough team. No one thinks UConn's going to win. Dave Portnoy yeah, just put in a bet. No, yeah, $600,000 yeah, I have for winning the whole tournament. UConn is on. I've as heavy a bet as I would. I don't bet, but if you I had bet? money and okay. I had, yeah. well, who do you I guys would, have? Who are your UConn. final four? No, I, didn't, I'm, I, got, I, I have UConn winning the whole thing. Same. UConn versus who in the final? In the final, I, that side scares me, but I have UConn. I got UConn, Houston in the final, and I'm I got okay with UConn yeah, and Houston, Houston two seems, ones, yeah. and I got Arizona and Tennessee two twos. Yeah, that's what I think. That's the final very ones. rarely do four ones get through. Almost never. Never. Yeah. yeah. So let's see, final four, let's go here. Here we go. Final four, I've got UConn, UNC, Duke, and Purdue. Purdue, uh, I forget that one kid's name, really big, tall kid. Edie, he's going exactly to be projected Edie. first round in the, in yeah. the NBA draft. Yeah, he was a player of the year last um, year. He's a stud. That kid's a stud. Also, my sleeper team um, is my sleeper team is Nebraska because this kid. I know exactly why you like this Nebraska. This kid, Malik, can you pull up? I know we're all over the you place. You put and we're money up against on the clock. that, though? But here's the thing. You I want Tom to, to just see this. Big, but you read the all art, wrong article. You read that Nebraska had a really great offensive line, and you went with them. <laughs> yeah, that's the article I read. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> Malik, do you have that They got kid? a great offensive <laughs> line. I'm going with Nebraska. No, there's Brady. this little kid. They call, him, they call him the Asian Steph Curry. Have you heard about this kid, Tom? <laughs> Watch this kid right here, Tom. Watch <laughs> yeah, this kid. but yo, you can't he put can your money on the Asian Steph Curry. Listen, man, oh, yes, you sure can. Why can't you? There's always that one kid that's always hot in the tournament. What if he was there's always that one kid. Remember Tom? the kid that played in the NBA for like four weeks? J who, Jimmy Fredette? Jeremy, 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 Jeremy Fredette. Jeremy Fredette. No, it's no, no, Jimmy Fredette. No, no, no. no, no, no. I'm talking about for he played with the, the Knicks. Knicks. It was the an Asian Clinton kid. Played. Jeremy Lin. Yeah, Jeremy Lin. He played, yeah. Jeremy he played, Lin. He played he went to Palo Alto. Jeremy he played for Lin Santa Clara. played a long time in the league, though. The problem is he just came out of the gate so heavy. He got an $80 million deal with Houston off of those two weeks. By the way, he's killing it overseas. Now he's playing Crushing it overseas. Right. Okay, sorry. He was a serviceable player for like a decade. But he never played up to those first two weeks, but he made a fortune off of them. Here's the sure. thing. Here's, here's two upsets for everyone at home. All right, ready? I've got Colorado over Florida. Colorado's coming off a win against Boise State in the final game of the first four. Okay, so that was a yeah, plan. Yeah, yeah. They, I got Colorado over Florida. That's today, okay? So people are going to watch this today. You're watching it live. Mark my words. They win today. And if they, if they lose, don't lose my number. Um, and then huge upset, huge. This is the upset. I love, I love a good upset in the first round. Ray, we were talking about this. Mm -hmm. um, South, South Dakota State over Iowa State. South Dakota has won their last eight games with double digits. Iowa State uh, is heavy favorites, but South Dakota I like a lot in this game. Tom, what do you think? Is that a stretch, or do you think it's possible? So MGM Bet, you know, gave me 
There you go. Hmm. 16 million. <laughs> Look at Ray's face. Don't Six, like it. 16 million to one odds. Yep. And GMB gave me That's on terrible. Seton Hall. <laughs> now, terrible. Seton Hall's not in the tournament. Right. But. MGM bet gave me 16 million to one before the selection Sunday. So, no, today. Oh my so gosh. I figured at a hundred bucks, that's 1.6 trillion dollars. So I'm. So why not make the bet? So yeah, did you, did you make unless the bet? you know something we <laughs> don't? Hold on, playing. Yes, it's, it's like it's all math. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's okay. a lunacy because all bets are legal now, right? That's right. the lunacy of it. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. So okay. Um, so anything else with the March Madness? So, so you have who do you have at winning the whole thing? You said. I got UConn over Houston. I like that. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. No, I, I mean... That's I, a safe pick. Yeah, those, but UConn is a safe pick. There's a lot of velocity behind there's, that. There's a lock. Even those, were my said. Last, those were my last two also. You know what I think hurt the tournament this year? What? Is that five favorites in conference tournament finals went out in the conference tournaments. And under normal circumstances, they would have gotten the automatic bid. And that would have let five extra teams get in somewhere. And I hate that they... When you don't win your conference tournament as a favorite, you get an at-large. <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. And that forces another team that could make one of those Cinderella type runs out of the tournament because well, those at large go away. But if that's Duke, North Carolina, mm -hmm. right. Duke wins the, the tournament. Right. But both of those were well, the North class, Car North class Carolina of, State won the tournament, right? Yeah. NC State. Well, I'm saying it for, for for example. Sure. Right. Yeah. So you're so what are you what are you saying there? I guess what I'm saying is where on on some of those things where where a team that wasn't supposed to win the whole thing goes for or, or a team. A team that should, I think, get into the bottom part of the tournament kind of gets pushed out when some of these automatic bids that would normally go to f high favorites, they, w they wind up falling short of where you think that they're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. Like, who, who lost out this year you think should have been in? Who do I think should have gotten to the tournament this year that didn't? A lot of the, well, a lot of the Big East teams. Only NC three, and only on three Big seat, East. Right? Only three Syracuse Big East. was no good. Hold on. Only three Big East teams got into the tournament, and three 20-win Big East teams got left out. Providence, Seton Hall, and St. John's. So I'm really hoping that the other ones that got in, Marquette and Creighton, make deep runs. That was my Seton Hall. And, I think, and I think UConn wins the thing. So I'm really hoping that the Big East teams that did get in show well so that next year they can say we left 20, three 20 win Big East teams yeah. out so I think Patino and St. John's had an argument I think Providence had an argument and Seton Hall obviously. Tom how far do you got Gonzaga going well here's the thing about Gonzaga here's the thing and then they're combustible then we'll wrap up we'll wrap up but Gonzaga uh, shout out to my dad Paul Reitmeyer he's a big Gonzaga fan um, why is Gonzaga always like a heavy favorite and then they always uh, they always crap the bed when it gets to uh, quote really? unquote nut cutting time, <laughs> if go, you will, go back look at their tournaments. Haven't they been like Sweet Sixteen, Sweet Sixteen? Are oh, they make deep runs? Yeah, they've been they were the championship 16, games a couple 16, years ago. Sixteen, eight, Final Four. Yeah, didn't they? Yeah, they go far. They always have a really good player that they usually had a big like a big tall. Usually a good, really good fundamental player like a Rui Hachimura or an Adam Morris or the guy from Oklahoma or, State um, uh, that's playing for Oklahoma State right now. Chet Holmgren. Chet Holmgren. Yeah, they always have He's somebody great. good there that they kind of. Everybody gets on his back, and he carries them far. It's about how far. So can he I carry. got them five twelve over McNeese, and then I got them five and four, and four over Kansas, but then losing in the round of sixteen to Purdue. That's what I have too. Nice, uh, and no sleepers. You have any sleepers for people at home if they're Michigan, betting today? Michigan State. I you got Michigan, Michigan State? State in the Elite Eight, and okay. then going down to Arizona. That's okay. And then who do you like? Uh, first round, do you like Utah State, TCU? Do you see a possible ups up there? That's in the Midwest Conference. Uh, Utah State, TCU. That's really tough. Um, <clears throat> TCU looked good in their conference tournament. They did. You know, and so I, I went with the which team is getting more mature at the right time of the year on my TCU pick, which could be wrong. They could lose the 30 to Utah State who just shoots the lights out. So it's like, go figure. Totally. I hate eight, nine, I, the eight nine, eight, nine picks are my least favorite pick. By the way, you know what also shows? Sure. That for all the debates that go on for three days after Selection Sunday, that you go take a look at everything, and you look at the history, and the seeding and the way they do it, we can get upset because of our favorite school or a case you could make for Seton Hall, a case you could make for those Big East teams, and they usually get it like really, 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 really close to right. Of course. Because you look at the way everything shakes out, and you say to yourself, all this extra debate happened when they went to 64 teams sure. because of the debate. Yeah. 
think about it. When you go to 64 teams, you doubled the tournament, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, well, Tom, this is And been... then you still have debates. Yeah. But Listen, we're going we're gonna to solve it with college football, right? Yes, we will. And, uh, Tom, we can't wait to have you back on. This has been an absolute treat. Oh. This has been fantastic. I, mean, I know an hour goes by fast when you're having fun, that's for sure. Um, do you have any parting words for the people at home in terms of business, sports, or just something personal in life? You know, it's funny. When it comes to business, I always like to say, words talk, numbers scream. But in sports, you know, sometimes numbers talk and then words scream over beer. So it's, it's <laughs> or spilt beer or spilt beer, but yeah. it always seems to be a little different. But in business and in in politics, it's usually words talk, numbers scream. And I just think sports are kind of interesting because sometimes players just are point at the scoreboard and they don't say a word, and then the other guy screams. And I just I've always always felt that that part of sports is kind of fun. You yeah, know, sitting back, analyzing it, and arguing on it. And let me tell you. A night was it a nine and a ten six wild card in the Super Bowl beat a team that was this far from perfect. Yep. So, so where can people find you, Tom? How do they find you? What's the? I know oh, we know the you biz can find me yeah. Socials at Tom Ellsworth on X, Ellsworth Thomas on Instagram, and you can find me with the home team on the PBD podcast. Also and find Tom on Manect. and you can find me on Manek. Want to ask me questions? Got thoughts about business or anything? Download Manek. Find me, ask me a text question, I'll answer you a text, answer you a video, or set up one-on-one -on -one video. Questions about career, questions about startups, questions about business decisions, a lot of stuff on there. It's a really great way to stay in touch with myself and many other experts on the neck. You know, please check it out. Awesome, thank you, Tom, so much. This has been fantastic. Mano, do you have any parting words for the people at home? No, nah, same thing. Thank you to Tom for coming out. I know he's a busy man. We appreciate your time always. Uh, find me on Manek, same deal. Got to play a little football. Getting to live my dream now doing this. Let me help you live yours. Find me on Manek. Let's talk. Ray? Yeah, great show. Thank you, Tom, for coming. And uh, yeah, you can catch me in the next sequel of Scarface. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Malik, what do you have for the people at home? Make it fast, baby. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, don't forget to check out vtmerch.com. We got some cool stuff on there so you can be nice and fresh in your valuetainment gear. Also, you can find me on Instagram at It's Me Malik. And on my neck, Malik Hudson. Thanks for watching today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's been our show. I've been Brady Matthews. Thank you so much for watching The Mouthpiece. We want to thank you guys uh, for watching. Also, please subscribe to our channel at Valuetainment Sports. Click on The Mouthpiece. Lots of stuff on there. Reels from Mano. Uh, shorts that we're going to do with Tom Ellsworth, as well as Ray, as well as Malik. Lots to look forward to. And thank you guys for watching live. We'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend and tournament time. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>